Good afternoon. I'm Katherine Santoro, Director of Policy and Development at the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. And on behalf of NICM, welcome to our webinar today. We're pleased to have an excellent panel of experts with us today to explore ways to bridge the gap between primary care and behavioral health care. Before we hear from them, I'd like to thank NICM's president and CEO, Nancy Chalkley, who led the development of today's webinar, as well as the NICM staff who helped to convene this event today, including Kate Ellis, Katie McDonald, Carolyn Myers, and Kirsten Wade. You can find biographical information for all of our speakers along with today's agenda and copies of slides on our website. We also invite you to live tweet during the webinar today using the hashtag behavioral health. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Christopher Carroll, who is Director of Healthcare Financing and Systems Integration for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. We're so honored he's with us today to provide an overview of the many federal initiatives to increase access to behavioral health services and ensure these services are integrated and coordinated with physical health services. Chris? Thank you, Catherine. On behalf of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and its leadership, um, I'd like to express my gratitude to the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation for the opportunity to present today. It's a great opportunity for us. And to thank those that are in attendance, um, I'd also like to thank you, Catherine, for the invitation and for arranging this, um, as well as my longtime colleague, Sarah Wattenberg from ONDCP, for sharing this time with me. Um, I hope you find what we present today both interesting and actionable. And with that, uh, we'll go on to uh, what we're going to cover. So this is the agenda. We don't have a whole lot of time, so we'll be as, as quick as possible here. But I'd like to give you a, a brief overview of SAMHSA, some of the real costs and consequences of uh, our healthcare system, some of the federal efforts around system services and payments, and then to end with kind of what to watch out for, what, what you all should be looking for. Um, so this is the SAMHSA budget overview. Uh, SAMHSA's uh, 2016 budget is about $3.7 billion, which is a, about a $45 million increase from the fiscal year FY15 budget. Um, this, our priorities, I think, uh, are in specific areas, strengthening crisis system, uh, addressing prescription drug and opioid abuse, expanding the behavioral health workforce, and the president's now is the time plan. Now, the president, uh, President Barack Obama, released now is the time as a plan to increase access to mental health services. SAMHSA played a key role in supporting a number of activities outlined in the plan that's available on the web. Um, it, it does uh, include development and funding of new grant, grant programs, collabor collaboration across HHS and with other federal agencies. Um, we, we, you know, it's, it's very important for us to support Now's the Time, and I, we do feel that our budget supports the President's commitment to investment in the nation's health through key behavioral health priorities. So system cost. I think everybody has, has seen this. It, it, we, we have known this for a long, long time, that mental health conditions um, were, were extremely costly. I don't think the data was exactly lined up right for, for a long time. But in health affairs, in the re recent release of health affairs, um, the data was paired in a way that starts to express the magnitude of system costs in delivering behavioral health. And this is kind of the way that it was paired up. So you can see uh, civilian, non-institutionalized, and in institutionalized and active duty military. When you combine the, those two major sources of uh, services, you get significant uh, system costs, more than heart conditions, more than trauma, more than cancer, more than heart disease. It's a significant uh, um, issue for our healthcare system moving forward. We, uh, like I was saying, I, I think we have known this intuitively for a long time, um, but this data is especially helpful in, in uh, us relating that case. So if we are to look 
drill down just a little bit from system cost, we can see the costs of mental and physical health comorbidities. On the left-hand side of this screen, you see uh, some Medicaid numbers. On the right-hand right side, you see Medicare. Now, these charts say essentially the same thing, that treatment of specific conditions and chronic diseases become exponentially more costly as behavioral health, uh, health conditions co-occur. You can see from the left on each of the slides, there's no mental illness or substance abuse uh, and the cost associated with that. You start to layer on uh, mental illness and uh, no drugs, drugs and no mental illness. And uh, on the far right-hand side of the Medicaid data, you see mental illness and, and drug and alcohol cost, how, how much that raises the cost of care. Same is, same is true on uh, Medicare. This is with uh, chronic conditions and severe mental illness. So impacts on physical health. Mental health problems increase the risk for physical health problems and substance use, uh, increase the risk for chronic disease, tr sexually transmitted disease, HIV, AIDS, and mental illness. The cost of treating common diseases is higher when a patient has untreated behavioral health problems, mostly preven preventable or treatable. In the box to the right, you can see um, uh, diabetes treatment, patients per year. With diabetes alone, it's about uh, $50 million. Uh, with a behavioral health condition, about $250 million. So significant impacts on cost uh, related to co-occurrence of disease. So these are some of the cascading consequences. and, and we know that um, behavioral health conditions are a, 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 a really a, just a huge public health uh, issue. We know that there are many things uh, as it relates to behavioral health that um, start to uh, have significant impacts on people. So in 2014, nearly one in five or roughly 43 million adults had a di diagnosable uh, mental health disorder. Yet only about 55% uh, did not receive uh, mental health uh, services in the past year. There were uh, 41,149 suicides in 2013. Uh, that's a rate of 12.6 per 2,000 is equals about 113 su suicides each day or one every 13 minutes. We know opioid misuse is a growing public health problem. Estimates show 150% increase in opioid-related hospital stays over the last two decades, yet only 17% of patients engaged in treatment within 30 days of discharge. Drug overdose is the leading cause of accidental death in the U.S. with 47,055 lethal drug overdoses. It's about 129 opioid deaths per day in the United States. And what all this really means is about 80% of those, those people that um, are experiencing behavioral health conditions present only or primarily only in specialty medical or surgical settings. So all of these things up here around suicide and opioid misuse um, and mental health conditions may seem to be specialty uh, behavioral health um, treatment issues. Practically, they're being, they're being seen in primary care and general medical settings. So, just from the 30,000-foot view, um, there's, a, there's a number of things that SAMHSA and its federal partners have been in, engaged in. Our relationship with CMS is very important to us um, as the largest payer of behavioral health services in the United States. Um, that's that's uh, important that, that um, our, our, our wonderful partners at CMS um, uh, help us. Um, and we help them to uh, identify issues that um, are important within behavioral health systems. Um, we do this through uh, the delivering informational bulletins. We've done informational bulletins on medication-assisted treatment, coverage service design of behavioral health uh, services for youth. We have ongoing interactions with them around payment rules, waiver consultation, state plan amendments, regulation review, quality measures, same-day billing guidance, and parity. Of particular importance is a new grant program, a demonstration grant program that SAMHSA is putting on, um, which is uh, called Section 223 of the Pro 
Protecting Access to Medicare Act of 2014, which starts to certify community mental health centers as certified community behavioral health clinics. Um, we, uh, SAMHSA has uh, managed the criteria development there. CMS has developed the prospective payment system. And our friends at uh, ASPE, the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, will evaluate the programs and its, and its outcomes. Um, another large uh, effort that we have been working together with, with our partners at HRSA, is the SAMHSA Center for Integrated Health Solutions, which starts to move different practices and policies around integration um, into practice in communities. Um, this starts to show itself through an, um, a number of different uh, federal initiatives and efforts to support integration. And, and when SAMHSA talks about integration, um, that's, um, I think, more specific to our grant programs that we, we, we run and the types of individuals that we uh, serve, which are individuals with serious mental illnesses. Um, so as we think about that, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, a few years ago, maybe five, seven years ago, we started seeing the data on the importance of addressing comor comorbid conditions in, in individuals, especially those with serious mental illnesses who had have life expectancies significantly shorter than the general population. This translates into um, SAMHSA's um, uh, PBHCI program, which is um, uh, primary behavioral health care integration grants, of which is uh, about $100 million in grants with 100 plus sites. Um, we're also very interested in primary care and addiction services. Um, we've not gotten um, a tremendous amount of uh, support, uh, congressional support or other support on that, although we're seeing the comorbidities around uh, substance use and substance use conditions are as, if not more significant than uh, those with serious mental illnesses. Uh, there's other things across the CDC, such as Million Hearts and AHRQ. CMMI is, is uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, is doing a lot of tremendous things. Uh, to test grant models using SAMHSA and AHRQ indicators. Medicare Accountable Care Organizations, the next-gen accountable care organizations show promise as well. Uh, wrapping up here, service models, payment structures, and demos to achieve better care and value. State innovation models, I think, are, are uh, really, really interesting and show promise. Health Homes, our partnership with um, CMS has been particularly helpful there. We've done 50 consultations with 25 states. Uh, the DUALS demo, I think, shows promise. Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative, which is a large technical assistance and training effort out of CMS, which is designed to help clinicians achieve large-scale health transformation. Uh, the Medicaid Innovation Accelerator Program, focusing on three areas. One, most importantly, is substance use disorders. And this one is particularly important, I think, is CMS changes to the physician fee schedule, the collaborative care model in primary care. That, uh, we, we, are, we are encouraged to, uh, that CMS is, is taking that, uh, is, is using that payment lever to affect change. Um, that's broader than integration, I think. Um, it's not SMI focused, but it still holds promise as we look at those co-occurring disorders. Um, so I would encourage you really to take a look at um, that, which will be effective, I believe, January 1. And we may hear a little bit more about that in just a little bit. And here are the New Horizon uh, issues that I wanted to, to just make sure that, that you all pay attention to. There are even more new payment and service models and grant programs coming out of CMMI, with particular focus on population health. Um, the president has um, just this year um, uh, established a tax, task force on mental health parity and the Addiction Equity Act. Um, that task force is holding meetings with different constituents. Um, it will produce a report by October 31st to the president. I think that there will be actionable 
concrete steps that are defined for what the government should take action on, and I think it would be telling as well for, for you all to, to see what's going on. Value-based purchasing and pharmaceuticals, this, this is very interesting um, as well. Expansion of opioid treatment. SAMHSA is, is doing a lot. You, you may have seen that we have expanded the limit of uh, the number of doctors that uh, can prescribe buprenorphine to, from 100 to 275. Um, and, a, and an issue that's particularly um, promising to us is the, the further development of behavioral health quality measures. We really need to, um, with, with the importance of behavioral health, we know, really need to be able to turn to the, the quality measures and say, um, do the services that we provide work and, all, and are people getting better? So with that, I, I will leave it there and I guess turn it over or turn it back to Catherine. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. Uh, in addition to SAMHSA's comprehensive efforts, we wanted to expand on, on one of your points related to the opioid addiction crisis facing the nation. And we're honored to have Sarah Wattenberg, Senior Public Health Advisor in the Office of Policy Research and Budget in the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy to share their efforts to close gaps and access to treatment for substance use disorders. Sarah? Thank you, Catherine and Nickum, for inviting me to participate on today's webinar on behalf of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Chris, thank you for your great overview. That, that helps me a little bit with my presentation. Uh, today's topic is an important one, and I look forward to hearing from today's panelists. Let me first tell you a little bit about uh, the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Um, ONDCP is a component of the Executive Office of the President. By statute, we annually engage in three primary efforts to guide U.S. drug policy. We develop the National Drug Control Strategy, develop a consolidated national drug control program budget, and coordinate the implementation of U.S. drug policy by the different drug control, federal drug control agencies. You can see that our strategy, our national drug control strategy, has four overarching goals to renew U.S. drug policy to address the public health and public safety challenges of the 21st century. Specifically, our strategy is guided by three concepts. One, addiction is a brain disease that can be prevented and treated and from which people recover. Um, innovative new criminal justice programs can help stop the revolving door of drug use, crime, incarceration, and rearrest. But today we're here to talk about bridging gaps in access to services. And I'd like to put forth some ideas to close the significant service gaps that are impacting our ability to address the opioid crisis facing our nation. In 2014, over 47,000 people died from a drug overdose in the United States. That's nearly 130 people per day on average. 28,000 of those deaths involved opioids, both licit and illicit, including heroin. Overdoses specifically involving pain medicines have more than tripled between 1999 and 2014. These are staggering numbers, and yet the majority of people with an illicit drug use disorder do not enter treatment. In 2014, 80% did not obtain treatment. We call this the treatment gap, and now I'd like to talk a little bit about how we may be able to begin changing that. Medication-assisted treatment um, is an evidence-based intervention, but it isn't used as frequently as it should be. Substance use disorders are a brain disease, and we have medications to treat them. Looking at the top section of the slide, there are three types of medications that have been approved by the FDA for treating opioid use disorders. Methadone, 
long-acting injectable naltrexone, buprenorphine, and buprenorphine combination products. When these medications are used in combination with counseling and other psychosocial treatments, evidence shows that these approaches are effective. We have a lot of science behind MAT. A recently published systematic review found that treatment with naltrexone or buprenorphine was associated with better retention than a placebo or no medication. And the retention improved further when contingency management was used in addition to MAT. Another review of case reviews, meta-analysis, and random clinical trials concluded that MAT with psychosocial services at least doubles the rate of positive outcomes when compared to treatment with placebo or psychosocial treatment without medication. And a study in Baltimore found that increased access to medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder, particularly expansion of buprenorphine treatment, may have significantly contributed to a reduction in heroin overdose deaths from 1995 to 2009. MAT is considered a standard of care for opioid use disorders, and it is crucial that providers in both primary and specialty care settings become trained to prescribe these treatments. Equally important, insurers and policymakers must promote policies that include these medications as part of a comprehensive approach to treating substance use disorders. But there is stigma around the use of medication-assisted treatment, and the bias has resulted in a dangerously low rate of uptake. We see stigma among providers and insurers. We see the stigma in drug courts that may not allow the use of all available medicines, and we even see stigma within some of the fellowship programs. There are many paths to recovery, and they should all be supported. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, some of the federal actions that have been undertaken to drive change on this issue. In March, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services announced a targeted initiative aimed at prescriber training and education, increasing the use of naloxone and expanding the use of MAT. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration recently published a final rule that increases the number of patients a doctor can treat with buprenorphine from 100 to 275. In the first year, it is expected that this increase will allow another 40,000, a little more than 40,000 individuals to receive treatment with an increasing number of patients for each year after that, with a total of about 271,000 individuals being able to receive treatment within five years. This is also expected to have a significant impact in rural areas, which are currently served by smaller numbers of physicians certified to prescribe buprenorphine. In addition, our Health Services Resource Administration is devoting $200 million in funding to improve and expand substance use disorder services at community health centers with a focus on medication-assisted treatment. CDC has published guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain earlier this year. Last July, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services started a new demonstration program to allow states to test innovative approaches for substance use disorder services that also include MAT. The Department of Agriculture is devoting $1.4 million in grants to support rural areas as they address the opioid epidemic. And recently, the Department of Veterans Affairs is releasing a new policy requiring prescribers of controlled substances to check state prescription drug monitoring programs to ensure that a patient is not receiving multiple prescriptions that could threaten their health. The mental health Parity and Addiction Equity Act was passed in 2008. Uh, Chris talked a little bit about that. 
The goal of this parity law was to increase access to mental health and substance use disorder treatment services by requiring that insurance coverage for those services be provided in a way that was comparable to the coverage one would receive for medical and surgical care. A few things to understand about the law. Comparable does not mean you get the exact same services as one would get on the physical side. It means that insurance companies can't impose requirements for mental health and substance use disorder care that they don't also impose for medical and surgical care. For example, a company cannot require larger or more frequent copays or separate deductibles. A health plan also may not impose non-quantitative limitations. For instance, pre-authorization requirements must be comparable to what is required for medical or surgical care, and the processes for making decisions about coverage must be similar. The law does not require that insurance companies cover treatment services. Rather, it requires that if those services are covered, they be provided in ways that are comparable to medical surgical coverage. Some plans are required to include mental health and substance use disorder services as an essential health benefit under ACA, and when this is the case, ACA requires the benefit and then parity kicks in to require uh, comparability of coverage. Unfortunately, the implementation of the parity law has been inconsistent. And as a result, in March of this year, the President established a parity task force to identify the barriers to full implementation of the law, to promote best practices that can be used by federal and state agencies to ensure compliance, and to identify areas that could benefit from additional guidance. The President is committed to assuring the full realization of the parity law. A series of listening sessions, as Chris said, are taking place across the country to hear the perspectives and recommendations of consumers, providers, insurance companies, state insurance commissioners, and others. And this will culminate in a report that will be prepared for the President before October 31st. So that is just a little bit about what we are doing to um, address the problem. And here are some other ways that you can get more information about what we're doing. So that concludes my presentation. And I want to thank everyone again for inviting ONDCP to join you today. Thank you so much, Sarah. <clears throat> we're excited to now you a panel of speakers to help us learn about two evidence-based approaches that can be implemented in primary care to improve, improve clinical outcomes, measurement-based care and collaborative care, and to learn how health plans and public payers can support these approaches. We're joined by Henry Harbin, Special Advisor to the Kennedy Forum, John Fortney, Director of the Division of Population Health, at the, in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Washington, and Dr. Glenda Wren, Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Morehouse School of Medicine. Turn it over now to Henry. Thank you, Catherine. This is Henry Harbin. Um, as Catherine said, we're going to focus on two specific areas today. One, actually the first one, is going to be on best practices for integrating behavioral health care into primary care and vice versa. Um, that's going to be by John Fortney, and the second on measurement-based care by Glenda Wren. The, 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 in this area, we're going to focus on really the, probably the most evidence-based practice on how to integrate the general medical system and mental health and substance abuse, a particular evidence-based intervention called collaborative care to improve mental health services and substance abuse services in primary care. Um, the, the, the second area, what we're calling measurement-based care, is a focus on trying to improve accountability and transparency for those providers when they treat people with mental health and substance abuse disorders. And the focus here is really on trying to improve uh, the accountability and, and transparency by both primary care physicians, if they treat a person with these disorders, but also the whole specialty behavioral system. Uh, specifically, we're 
advocating here for the use of standardized quantifiable instruments when you track and treat a person with these disorders, just like an internist would do when they are measuring blood pressure uh, regularly when they're treating hypertension or hemoglobin A1Cs when they're treating diabetes. Both of these uh, priority areas have been a policy and advocacy of the Kennedy Forum. Uh, all three of us have been consultants to the Kennedy Forum over the last year or so to how to help um, the Kennedy Forum develop key policy areas. Patrick Kennedy created the Kennedy Forum about two years ago as a policy think tank and advocacy group to try to identify um, important policy areas that could transform the both access and the quality and effectiveness of care for people with these disorders. And as you heard from Sarah and Chris, there, you know, if you look at the public health metrics, both on suicide rates, disability rates, opiate deaths, um, the system is going in the wrong way. We're seeing a rapid deterioration of these public health metrics for people with these problems. And these are some of the solutions I think can help turn that around. Um, I'd like to say we were really pleased to see the announcement by CMS just in the past two weeks to announce a payment code, the creation of a payment code for payment for collaborative care and primary care, which John will talk more detail about. But this opens up, this is from Medicare Part B. It starts January 1, 2017. It creates a code that would be paid for or billed by primary care practices and would provide for the provision of hiring a behavioral health uh, care manager that would work within the practice and also a consulting psychiatrist. Um, this, um, this intervention has over 80 randomized controlled trials. I think this is particularly important, this now, this creation of patient in Medicare for all of the private insurers on the phone, if there are any Medicaid insurers, because this now creates a payment code for you all to be able to offer this evidence-based intervention. One of the reasons this is important is the majority of patients with mental health and substance abuse conditions are not treated in the, spe in the specialty behavioral system. They're treated and they get all of their care in the primary care system. And we know that unfortunately many of these outcomes are quite poor without these additional behavioral health resources that are applied within the practice. So I'm going to turn this over now to John to uh, give us more detail about collaborative care and then Glenda up there on what, what is important and, and how do we move forward on measurement-based care. John? Thank you, Henry. Um, thank you, Catherine. And I'd like to thank the, um, the Kennedy Forum for pulling this uh, panel together. Uh, I'm going <clears> to <throat> echo some of the information uh, that Chris had talked about and start off by saying that inadequately treated mental health disorders account for 27% of all disability in the United States. So that's a very large percentage. As you can see in this table, uh, it shows the cost of that mental health disorders to payers. So uh, you can see that 14% of commercial plan enrollees have a behavioral health diagnosis, a little lower in Medicare, a little higher in Medicaid, about 15%. Um, and the next two columns show the per member per month payments for those with and without a diagnosis, a behavioral health diagnosis. And you can see that those with uh, two and a half um, to three and a half higher uh, costs than those without. So for all insurers, it's 273% higher. And these are not due to the higher cost of treating behavioral health disorders. In fact, only a small portion of the cost uh, associated with the delivery of mental health care. These are due to uh, having to treat more physical health conditions for this population, the poor outcomes for the physical health treatment in this population, the greater number of ER visits, and hospitalizations. In fact, we don't really reach uh, many of the individuals with mental health disorders uh, with our services. So this, this slide comes from the National Comorbidity Study. The big blue circle is states with a mental health disorder. You can only see about a third or 36% get any formal treatment over the course of a year. Um, only 22% get any specialty mental health care, and only 12% psychiatry. Um, <clears throat> so we need to figure out how to reach a greater number of these, these people. 
uh, and even if we were to improve their access uh, through lower costs or closer services, um, the U.S. does not have the capacity to treat all these patients in especially mental health. First, to estimate that 96% of U.S. counties have a shortage of psychiatrists, with 70% of the need going unmet in these in these counties. So it is it's just not possible to refer our way out of this problem from referring from primary care to specialty care. Um, so how do we reach this patient? And the, answer, the most promising approach is to improve the management of mental health disorders in the primary care setting. Um, this improves access for patients because it's provided uh, in their nearby primary care clinic where they can get more timely appointments, it's less stigmatizing, and there are lower out-of-pocket costs for patients in the primary care setting. Um, equally as important, not only does it increase engagement for patients, but it also increases the capacity of specialty mental health providers because instead of taking over the treatment, they provide consultation and collaborate in time-limited treatments. Um, so it increases access to patients and increases the capacity of the mental health providers. Now there are lots of integrated uh, care models out there to choose from. Uh, most of the models are not evidence-based, meaning they have not been subject to rigorous evaluations. And some of those that have been uh, evaluated in a rigorous way have been shown not to work. So a number of things have been found to, to, to not be better than usual care, including uh, trying to educate primary care providers about how to treat mental health disorders. Um, likewise, uh, provider profiling does not, does not help. Uh, screening, say screening for depression, does not help unless there are adequate systems in place to ensure accurate diagnosis and treatment. And the two most commonly used uh, approaches to integrated care are also known not to work. So simply co-locating uh, a mental health provider uh, in a primary care clinic without systematic tracking of outcomes and delivery of evidence-based treatments does not work. And uh, nor does disease management, whereby the health plan um, uh, uses care managers to, to work with patients, but they don't collaborate uh, closely with the primary care provider. So those, those approaches are known not to work. Uh, collaborative care is one of the uh, evidence-based uh, integrated care practices. It's a specific type of integrated care model that operationalizes the principles of the chronic care model to improve access to evidence-based mental health treatments for primary care patients. It's uh, team-based, it's led by the primary care provider who's supported by a care manager and who gets consultation from a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist will provide treatment recommendations uh, for those patients who aren't improving as expected. It's, um, uh, typically the psychiatrist does not have encounters with patients, but rather the care manager reaches out to the patient, assesses their symptoms and treatment adherence communicates that to the psychiatrist when there's a problem, and then the psychiatrist makes a recommendation about how to change the treatment plan to the primary care provider. It's population-based in that it uses a registry to monitor treatment adherence and dropout. Uh, it is measurement-based, meaning uh, they monitor a patient reported outcomes over time to assess treatment response and to determine when uh, changes to the treatment plan need to be made. Uh, Glenda is going to be talking about that more about that in a minute. It's very patient-centered, so the care manager does proactive outreach to engage patients, activate them, promote self-management and treatment adherence, and coordinate their services. It is uh, evidence-based, so it's demonstrated cost-effectiveness in a diverse practice settings and patient populations, and it's also practice-tested, so there's been sustained adoption in hundreds of clinics across the country. I just want to emphasize the importance of using a registry. This helps the care managers uh, manage their caseload so they can identify which patients aren't engaged in care, which are falling through the cracks, um, and to uh, uh, evaluate outcomes over time and prioritize patients for um, uh, discussion during the psychiatric case review and consultation. Uh, registries can be as simple as spreadsheets but a fully functioning registry includes self-scoring rating scales, uh, screeners, and decision support. Um, electronic health record vendors are starting to make some progress to build in registry functioning in, into their um, uh, products, but there's, there's a long way to go. 
There are also some HIPAA-compliant web-based registries that are available, like the one offered by our AIM Center. So as, as Henry uh, discussed earlier, there was the Cochrane Review of the collaborative care uh, model. Uh, there were 79, 79 randomized controlled trials that had more than 24,000 patients enrolled in them. And compared to usual care, and usual care is usually screening for depression or anxiety and then referring the patient to especially mental health. Um, compared to usual care, there are higher response and remission rates where response is a 50% reduction in symptoms and remission is symptom free. And uh, there are big um, uh, clinical improvements substantial. So compared to usual care, collaborative care generates uh, an 18% median absolute increase in response rates and a 17% median increase in uh, re remission rates. So, th so there's uh, big improvements. Uh, it's also associated consistently with improvements in quality of life, patient satisfaction, and lower costs over the long run. Um, these results are consistent across diverse populations. Uh, it's been shown to be effective in all stages of life. Uh, it's effective for minorities, and it's effective across a range of diagnoses, including depression, anxiety, and substance abuse, where it focuses on medication-assisted treatment that Sarah was talking about. I can imagine that some of you are thinking uh, uh, that most primary care practices are not big enough to support a full-time care manager and a psychiatrist, and it's not possible to implement. Um, but actually, this is, this is not the case. The collaborative care model is effective even when the primary care provider, care manager, and psychiatrist are not physically co-located with one another. Um, with today's health information technology, all these providers can collaborate uh, with one another remotely. And as you can see in this figure, uh, with the patient in the middle, they still meet with their primary care provider face-to-face -face during prim traditional primary care appointments. In between those appointments, the care manager will make telephone calls, outreach calls to the patient. Uh, when the patient's not doing well, the care manager will uh, use the registry and the telephone to communicate with the, with the uh, psychiatric consultant, um, who will then come up with a revised treatment plan. And this revised treatment plan is communicated to the primary care provider through uh, usually a progress note in the electronic health record. Uh, a 2013 HRQ report concludes that collaborative care improves outcomes regardless of whether the collaborating providers are co-located. And I personally conducted three successful RCTs in small rural primary care practices where the care manager, primary care provider, and psychiatrist were not co-located with one another. Uh, collaborative care is practice tested outside the uh, context of research. Um, uh, so there have been numerous implementation trials and demonstration projects that show that it's feasible to implement and effective under real-world conditions. Just a few examples here are uh, COMPASS, which was done in seven states with Medicare and Medicaid plans that enrolled 4,000 patients. Another was DIAMOND, which was conducted in Minnesota with multiple commercial insurers. They used a bundled case rate to pay for collaborative care, and there were 12,000 patients in, in that demonstration. Uh, here in Washington State, the Mental Health Integration Program has been operating since 2008. It also uses a bundled case rate to pay for, with pay for performance, and 55,000 federally qualified health center patients have gone through that program. And the VA actually has the biggest integrated program in the U.S. that served over a million veterans. Uh, and this model combines both the collaborative care model and the behavioral health consultant model, which is another uh, popular model of integrated care. And uh, just to highlight that, um, we're recommending that the collaborative care model be a key element of a step care approach to treating mental health disorders. So starting from the, the bottom of this uh, step care pyramid, you know, many if not most mental health disorders can be handled by the PCP without any help. That's step one. Uh, another portion uh, require a curbside consultation with a consulting psychiatrist. That's step two, and for many patients, step three, uh, a warm handoff to a co-located mental health specialist for four to six sessions of counseling is very effective. That's the behavioral health consultant model. 
However, for a sizable portion, uh, patients need more than that, and they will need more intensive collaborative care to achieve response before being discharged back to the primary care provider. That's collaborative care in step four. And then some, some patients, of course, will need to be referred to the specialty mental health care system. So there, uh, if you're interested in deploying a collaborative care model, uh, there's uh, you need more information. There's a number of resources that are available. Uh, as Henry mentioned, the uh, uh, Kennedy Forum uh, recently published uh, an issue brief that details collaborative care and summarizes the key issues. And it provides guidance and recommendations for implementing collaborative care for purchasers, provider organizations, clinicians, uh, patients, and, uh, um, and family members. And that is available at that link at the bottom. Uh, our group has recently published a, um, a, a book about implementing collaborative care. Um, it's a very practical how-to book. Uh, one of the co-authors is Wayne Caton, who conducted the very first randomized trial of collaborative care here at the University of Washington, uh, recently passed away. Uh, includes lots of case studies and, and other practical information about how to uh, develop effective integrated care teams. And our, um, the Advancing Integrated Mental Health Solutions, or the AIM Center, also provides hands-on support for implementing collaborative care. Uh, our website offers a lot of free tools and webinars, and you can um, work with us to uh, get more hands-on training in uh, implementation. It's usually a three-step process where uh, you go to the website and um, you do some self-learning, uh, and then we come to your site to um, uh, do an on-site training that's very experiential and active uh, learning. It takes one to two days. And then uh, we provide post-implementation um, technical supports and, and, and coaching. Uh, we provide uh, webinars as well as um, uh, uh, case study calls for the care managers and uh, support for the consulting psychiatrists. Uh, our AIM Center is also working with the uh, APA to train thousands of psychiatrists to, to, uh, in consultation and case review under the context of the collaborative care model. Um, a couple of uh, past 12 to 18 months, there have been a couple of policy changes that strongly incentivize the implementation of collaborative care. The USPS now only recommends depression screening if a clinic has adequate systems in place to ensure accurate diagnosis and treatment. That's because screening alone is not effective. Uh, in 2016, uh, the um, Medicare consensus core set at, for accountable care organizations and patient-centered medical homes added depression, remission, and response as, um, as outcome performance measures. And as I reported before, these two um, outcomes can be substantially improved uh, by collaborative care by 17 and 18 percent, respectively, uh, absolute percent. Um, and then in 2017, NCQA HEDA's depression metrics will include uh, monitoring patients' outcomes uh, with depression using a PHQ-9 or PHQ-A. Um, Brenda will talk more about that measurement-based care approach, which is critical. But it will also add metrics on depression remission and response. And then finally, there have been, uh, just in the last couple of months, major progress on reimbursement for collaborative care. The AMA CPT board just approved CPT codes for collaborative care. As Henry mentioned, CMS has uh, proposed new G codes for the um, Medicare uh, fee schedule for 2017. This is likely to be adopted by private insurers as well. Um, New York and Washington State Medicaid have collaborative care programs, which is a monthly case rate for eligible beneficiaries. It bundles the payment for the care management and psychiatric case review with pay for performance withholds. And many accountable care organizations are being uh, held for mental health outcomes as well. Um, uh, so for example, here in Seattle, Boeing's contract with the University of Washington ACO includes benchmarks for depression response and remission rates, where uh, our, our, our UW is at risk if PHQ-9 scores are not collected or our uh, patients are not improving according according to, to benchmark. And so the NCQA 
see those depression metrics are kind of driving this, this value-based purchasing. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So I think, Glenda, you're up next. Yes, I'm just going to wait a moment for my slides to come up. Thank you so much, John, for that introduction, and to Catherine for inviting us to speak today and for the Kennedy Forum for putting together this panel. So I'm going to drill down into uh, measurement-based care, which has now been mentioned by two of the previous presenters, um, to make sure that we're all on the same page about what measurement-based care is and um, how you can think about implementing it. So measurement-based care is the systematic administration of symptom rating scales, as well as using the results in order to drive clinical decision-making. And this is referred to at the level of individual patients. Now, it's true that you can use measurement-based care to aggregate the results of screening to understand something about populations or subpopulations in terms of their health benefit, but the actual measurement is at the level of individual patients. I'd also like to note a forthcoming publication that um, we have co-authored that will be out in psych services, and the citation is below for those of you that want to take, take a look out for that. So you may be wondering, don't we already use measures when we treat patients? Uh, behavioral health care has been provided for a long time, and I don't see why this is something that's new. Well, in fact, only 17.9% of psychiatrists and 11.1% of psychologists in the United States routinely administer symptom rating scales to their patients. And you can imagine that if that's the case for specialty behavioral health settings, then what do those numbers look like for primary care? They may be using measures for screening, but not using them in a way that allows them to look at outcomes over time as they're using prescriptions and other interventions to manage depression and anxiety. So for the 80% of psychiatrists and 90% of psychologists, it goes a little bit like this. How are you doing? And the patient says, I'm good. But they may feel lost, alone, desperate. They may be experiencing worsening of symptoms. And that's really problematic if we're not able to detect that. Well, you might say, you know, if most care is being practiced this way, it must be right, it must actually be working. But in fact, we know that it's not. When we rely on clinical judgment alone, mental health providers detect worsening for only 21.4% of their patients that have increased symptom severity. So we're actually really poor at detecting when our patients are going off track. And that's true for specialty providers who have additional training and should be able to detect this. So it means that it's even more important for primary care providers that do not have that level of training to be able to have diagnostic clarity or to know um, just by the clinical interview if a patient isn't doing well. Together, these issues lead to clinical inertia that's really unintentional. It's not that providers are not trying to do the right thing. It's just that they don't have the tools that they need to know whether or not they should change the plan or should treatment stay the same. Common sense would say that if a person is not responding to treatment, you should change the plan. But this system and this practice leads to failure to detect treatment non-response and a resultant keeping of the same plan, despite the fact that the patient is not getting better or they're getting worse. So when you utilize measurement-based care approach, it has a very strong evidence in the context of collaborative care. Measurement-based care is a fundamental component of collaborative care. So we know from many studies that you find improved clinical outcomes when you are utilizing measurement-based care. It is acceptable to patients and providers. It actually promotes shared decision-making and engagement in care because the same information is available to patients and providers as to how the patient is doing and why I'm recommending an increase in medication or addition in therapy. And we also know that it's feasible at large scale. The studies have also shown that there are some ineffective methods of implementing measurement-based care. And the first is um, just screening and referral, which is probably the general usual care, primary care, you're doing depression screening, oh, I see that you're depressed, let me refer you to the specialty. Um, care clinic or provider. That doesn't work. 
It also doesn't work if you screen and then remind providers about clinical guidelines. You might think that that would work if they just tell the person, here's a reference, you should read it now to help you treat this patient. That also doesn't work. It's also really important that you are using the measure in a frequency that is enough to inform clinical decision making. So there are a lot of great tools out there, but they're not utilized frequently enough to actually drive clinical decision making. So if you're just assessing something every six months, but that, that measure might change more frequently, you're, not, you're going to miss the opportunity to make a change. There was also a study where they gave feedback of the assessment outside of the context of the clinical encounter, and timing really does matter. So it's not as effective when the current recent assessment is not available at the point of care in the clinical encounter. We know that there are large-scale examples of usual care being transformed to be measurement-based, um, both in research as well as um, within the federal level. So two large-scale research studies, the STAR-D trial and the step BD trial, were usual clinical um, care practices that were looking at differences in certain medication treatment regimens. And they utilized a measurement-based care approach. Um, subsequently, Kaiser Permanente and the Washington State large implementation that you just heard of were also examples where measurement-based care was implemented. The VA, as you just heard, um, is using measurement-based care in their behavioral health lab within primary care to look at depression outcome change for primary care providers that are managing depression in their practice, as well as in the mental health service line, measurement-based care is utilized also to detect improvement. So there's an example of both in primary care as well as specialty care settings where measurement-based care has been used. In the Department of Defense side, they also have developed a behavioral health data portal for specialty mental health clinics, and it's also being incorporated into their integrated primary care setting in the DOD side. So in addition to the issue brief on collaborative care that the Kenny Forum helped to produce, there was also a measurement-based care issue brief that you can download as well. And there was a couple of um, points that were specific to payers that I just wanted to share with you today. The first, Henry mentioned, is one of the main benefits is transparency. So now that we have the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Act, payers are being held accountable to offer equivalent benefits. And so this data can really be helpful when you aggregate the results across patients to make the outcomes more transparent and to allow payers to see the observed outcomes of treatments that they're now required to reimburse for. This will also help payers to make more informed decisions about value-based care purchasing, as well as help to develop and encourage smart provider networks. So then now that you have this data, you can use that information to identify where your higher performers are and what are they doing on the ground that's leading to that better outcome. And finally, payer reimbursement. By having um, return on investment data readily available, you can see what would be the benefit of, al of allocating dollars for one intervention versus another in relation to mental health and substance use disorder services. And in total, these measures are also actionable so that you can create and embed feedback loops that will allow clinical practices to move towards continuous quality improvement and performance improvement. Um, the measurement-based care core measure supplement um, came from the demands of individuals that helped to create the measurement-based care issue brief. And this is really designed to fill the gap in payers, providers, other stakeholders that wanted to say what measures could we use. And this actually came through a lot of the pre-webinar questions as I was screening through them. This supplement includes tools for adults as well as for child and adolescent patients, um, for mental health disorders as well as substance use disorders, and provides a set of core outcome measures that would be suitable for inclusion in measurement-based care. Um, some of the recommendations here are that payers should use measures that are clinically useful, that are time efficient, and that enable monitoring of aggregate data on quality and population health. So we're not saying you need to use these measures. There might be comparable ones that you have developed or have heard of. They need to share these characteristics. And for payers that are interested in incentivizing measurement-based care, it's also really important that you account for the case mix 
in different populations based off the severity of their condition and their diagnosis as well. So not to propose um, rigid outcome measure thresholds and time payment to that in a rigid way, but accounting for case mix vari variation. So I'd just like to close to um, comment on the fact that we believe that this is coming, the future is coming in terms of the expectation that measurement-based care will be the way in which we provide these services both in primary care and specialty care settings. We already know that the National Quality Forum and NCQA continue to expand behavioral health measures and include them in their new guidance. The American Psychiatric Association's Council on Quality is also actively engaging discussion on measures so that the provider professional organizations can also weigh in to see which measures um, we support. And the Joint Commission will likely move their standards to measurement-based care in um, move standards to measurement-based care in 2017, so we can look forward to that as well. Um, and finally, MACRA is another recent example of how measurement-based care is expanding to all providers. So I think I'll close there and turn it back over to Catherine. Thank you all so much for your work and for explaining those two approaches. Um, we have posted links to the issue briefs that were mentioned by the speakers on our website, um, along with all of the speaker slides so you can access um, the additional resources that they've mentioned. Turning to our final presentation today, we're excited to learn how Anthem is supporting integration of behavioral health and primary care in both their commercial and government business, and I'm pleased to introduce Charles Gross, Vice President, Behavioral Health and Physical Health Integration for Anthem's Government Business Division, and also Dr. Sherry Dubester, Vice President of Behavioral Health and Clinical Programs for Anthem's Commercial Business. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, this is Charles Gross, and, and on behalf of uh, Anthem and Dr. Dubester and myself, I want to thank uh, Nickham for putting on this fascinating uh, and timely um, webinar. I've been furiously taking notes and will be reaching out to some of my fellow presenters right after the meeting. Uh, so thanks again for hosting this, Catherine. It's a, a wonderful opportunity. And I know, Glenda, you said the, the, uh, the future is coming as, as you ended. Uh, I, I think you're right on target. In fact, I would argue the future is here. It's just uh, unevenly distributed, as a, a, a writer of who I'm quite fond of once said. So I think they're absolutely collaborative care is here. And to that end, um, when I took my first job as a practicing psychologist, I was working in the Kaiser Permanente system and often uh, would find myself uh, leaving the consulting floor where the behavioral health department was located. I was doing child and family work and I would uh, go down to pediatrics um, because that's where the patients were. So uh, I, I, looking back, I think I was practicing we're trying to practice collaborative care, but the important difference is I didn't have a model and I certainly didn't have any measure. Um, so it's very exciting to, to be at a point uh, in terms of the evolution of the uh, uh, practice patterns where we're starting to get uh, um, some of the important uh, um, framework and infrastructure pieces in place. So a little bit um, about uh, Anthem. Um, you can see we're a, a large uh, insurer. We're both in the commercial Medicaid and Medicare markets across um, most of the United States. Um, and, and you can see by, frankly, by even my job title that the company is committed both on the government business side and on the commercial side towards um, pushing forward um, aggressively with an integrated uh, care approach to uh, health. Um, certainly, and it's, it's been reassuring to see, Chris, when he presented the data on the exponential uh, multiplier that behavioral health uh, does, drives in terms of cost structures, looking at our, our Anthem data, we see exactly the same thing across, again, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial. Um, so we are, we are uh, pushing aggressively uh, into this area. Uh, you can see some numbers down below in terms of uh, consumers with both a behavioral and uh, physical health diagnosis. Uh, you know, we, we looked at that real carefully in terms of the presentation. And interestingly, I think the 
the, um, the important point to underscore here is that physical health diagnoses are typically, unfortunately and sadly, under-diagnosed uh, uh, in the Medicaid um, uh, business because consumers, frankly, are not coming in to get their care, um, um, and I think our, the diagnoses are, are missing. Um, what is Anthem's overall approach? We're going to talk, and Sherry is going to talk in, in a fair amount of detail about what we're actually doing on the ground. Um, but, but at the broad level, what Anthem is committed to is assessing, both assessing what the level of integration is, and, and by that I mean both how we're providing integrated care inside the organization in terms of our approach to case management, um, but also just as importantly, if not more importantly, how um, we're working with our primary care network um, in terms of this, the, the sorts of uh, resources and both, both um, uh, consulting resources and most importantly financial resources that we can provide to them to support their efforts to deliver integrated care at the primary care level. Um, one of the things that we can do and are working very uh, closely with um, the primary care practices is around the, the, uh, the topic of data and data analytics, um, uh, registries, where we're able to provide them a great deal of, of real-time information about their populations, um, current health status. I think uh, an opportunity where we have more work to do, and, and frankly are looking forward to that kind of work, are around the sorts of measurement-based care uh, that my uh, fellow presenters were describing. Um, I think it is, it is a, a bit early in, in that process, um, um, and I think we are, again, at, at the forefront of that, and we've been working with the AIM Center with, with some of our practices to get them um, uh, moving forward. Um, but I would describe the state of those efforts at Anthem at, at, as at the intermediate level, in that we've got lots of practices doing a whole bunch of different things in terms of practice integration. And we're looking to more and more closely work on a more detailed level to um, structure uh, integrated care around the sorts of collaborative care models um, that John was describing. Um, we do that through a variety of dimensions, consultations with the practice, contracting arrangements with the practices, working on workflow development, learning collaboratives. And frankly, also contracting with the practices once they're on board to make sure that, uh, uh, that this hard work, which is it's not inexpensive, it's additional work that, that primary care practices have to do, that they're compensated both for that and, and also compensated for improved outcomes. Uh, and we do that in a variety of uh, innovative contracting um, uh, opportunities that we, we both have in place with practices and continue to evolve uh, literally as we speak. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this chart. I mean, this is um, something that, that you've seen in the literature. There are many, many models of integrated care. Um, one of the things that we're working hard at doing um, is looking at our primary care networks, uh, particularly you know, larger practices in the spirit of having to start somewhere. Um, working collaboratively with them to assess where they're at on the spectrum, and then to the extent we can move practices along the continuum to the right side towards a fully integrated model, that's where we're looking to go. And again, we do that, and I would say, again, over time we've done that um, several years ago. We had Anthem-based case managers embedded in practices, and that had some good outcomes. It also presented a lot of challenges. We really now have moved to a model where we are reimbursing practices to do the collaborative care model themselves, um, literally paying them to have the case management services and care coordination services in the primary care practice setting. Okay, and now I'm going to have uh, pitch it to Sherry and get, get into some more detail, which I think everyone will find quite interesting. Thanks, Charlie. And likewise, just wanted to thank Catherine and uh, NIHCM and also uh, the Kennedy Forum and uh, the speakers have been uh, wonderful and really uh, providing a lot of thoughtful points to consider, as Charlie said. Um, 
So if we take Anthem's approach that Charlie has been framing up and start thinking about what are we doing specifically, um, in a sense, we're really doing all the models that people have been hearing about, though I would say that our biggest opportunities are in uh, formalizing a system and s infrastructure for uh, metrics-based care, which uh, I think is tremendously compelling. But we start always with uh, what level of integration the practice is at, and also what are their objectives. Um, there are many different uh, uh, practice delivery models out there, ranging from uh, you know FQHCs, federal qualified health centers on the Medicaid side, to ACOs, to uh, small practices on the commercial side, et cetera. And they have have different capabilities, different skill sets, and different interests in terms of uh, what constitutes improvement in collaborating around medical behavioral uh, integrated care. Um, the data we've been able to show them has been very helpful because as we've pulled forward uh, what are the top cost drivers for our uh, collaborative care practices, uh, behavioral health is, is really uh, always in the top set of those drivers. And I think uh, several presenters have shared data that uh, really formalizes that, that if you're a diabetic and have a mental health issue, uh, et cetera, you are more likely to uh, incur higher costs. Um, so the range of things we can do then, starting maybe on the left in terms of collaborating on workflow development and learning, uh, ranges everything from co-location in the collaborative care models that uh, you heard presented from Washington and that uh, we've implemented, especially in some sites on the Medicaid side. Uh, to what we would call practice transformation. And uh, we have a staff, a field staff, a large field staff actually, that goes out and works with practices, uh, works on, uh, looks at their workflows, looks for opportunities to improve, both in terms of coordinating with behavioral health specialists in the community, as well as how to leverage if they have behavioral health capabilities within their own practice or are interested in that, how they might expand in that way. Um, I think we've heard several points about uh, the screening in itself not being effective, but that if it can be formalized within a robust context of the diagnosis, the brief intervention, and the referral into treatment, the, the classic expert, if you will, um, that that's a very important component of primary care picking up on chemical dependency issues, on mental health issues, et cetera. And we've done a lot with uh, educating primary care doctors on the codes, on the ability to bill for those codes, and on helping them understand what to do if they feel that they need additional support in uh, finding resources for those patients. A lot comes down to promoting care coordination um, and some of the health home uh, programs obviously bring that in uh, you know, by having the physical co-location, but I've heard also today and appreciate the comments about virtual integration and we'll talk a little bit more about the technology uh, in some of the next few points. Um, medication management, of course, is an important arena, both for uh, childhood, adolescent, psychotropic medication management, and we have some special programs there, as well as generally really pushing uh, gaps in care information that support adherence. Uh, to uh, our primary care doctors through some of the analytics and reporting that are now starting to become uh, a very uh, part of the infrastructure, essentially, of our provider partnerships. From a leveraging technology standpoint and improving access, uh, we are working very hard on our telehealth strategies. Um, that comes in a few different forms, one of which would be uh, a, a program called Live Health Online where we have pushed out psychology services to uh, uh, our commercial population uh, and are working on our psychiatry services. We've also pushed out those services through our EAP, our employee assistance programs, and now have a child and adolescent attendance to 17-year-old age program for uh, telehealth as well. And that allows us to start thinking about that virtual integration that has been one of the themes in today's meeting, because through various configurations of Life Health Online, we can start creating a version that really supports that primary care practice, and then piping in support services, whether it's uh, uh, psychology services, you know, therapy services, or uh, psychiatric consultation as well. And then finally, we have internally within Anthem uh, case management and care management resources that we will also refer into, including um, a dedicated team of case managers who support some of our provider collaboration uh, relationships. The next slide 
highlights again some of these pieces that we've been talking about. I'll also highlight that um, in Georgia on the Medicaid side, we have a telehealth partnership that has rolled out to, uh, to multiple sites. And, um, excuse me. that has rolled out to multiple sites and is delivering um, telebehavioral health services. And we also have rolled out online cognitive behavioral therapy services, which also has broader resiliency type of components, which again is a very important part to broadening access because there's a piece of this that is very amenable to self-management. And so what we're seeing in terms of some of our initial results, and uh, we're looking for this to mature over time into true metrics-based care, but I would say these are more really just initial engagement or uptake kind of measures largely, is that uh, we have embedded behavioral health clinicians in uh, multiple states, 10 states with uh, primary uh, care pediatric practices. Um, there are broader uh, rolling out of integrated care models in eight states. And in CareMore, which uh, really takes care of the more frail elderly population, providing both the payer and the provider side, behavioral health is fully integrated into that care and so really part of their uh, automatic delivery at their 41 care centers that they uh, manage patients in. Our telehealth uptake is, is starting to uh, really pick up, uh, both for uh, in Georgia at this point, uh, in the last quarter that was measured, there was uh, over 3,000 visits. And for Live Health Online, which started really just in January with um, you know, pretty small uptake, we're now seeing uh, that since its launch, we're up to um, about 1,000, uh, about 1,100 visits uh, since that launch with the new capabilities that I mentioned earlier. Um, we're continuing to push the cognitive behavioral online services as well and working on how we can uh, better bring that into our, uh, into our care management workflows as well as beginning to test how we can bring it into the provider setting and make that part of what the providers can help refer patients into and then make that part of their follow-up in their workflows. Uh, I just want to say a couple things about the opioid epidemic. I think we've heard some uh, very compelling uh, pieces on that in today's presentation. It's something that Anthem is working extremely hard on in terms of increasing access to medication-assisted therapy uh, with the supporting behavioral health services. And we're doing that both in the specialty segment of behavioral health providers, the addiction specialists, but also we feel strongly, especially in rural geographies, about working with our primary care providers to help them become comfortable with uh, picking up uh, medication-assisted therapy prescribing, having the surrounding uh, behavioral health services that is part of the best practice treatment, and then having additional support with an anthem if they are running into problems and they need some additional assistance. Um, that's also surrounded by uh, more expansion of peer recovery support services um, and uh, a kind of a resource line, if you will, uh, when providers or consumers have questions about those services. There's a lot of additional strategies going on in terms of the opioid piece, but the behavioral medical integration, I think, really comes to a, a head in an issue like this where we have to uh, use those tools to adequately address the epidemic. And then finally, in terms of future opportunities, um, I mentioned earlier that we are eager to expand telehealth. We, we see telehealth as a very important component of addressing the access issue. For the psychiatry piece, our plan is to uh, tightly coordinate that back with care, maybe having the PCPs refer to the psychiatrist or the telehealth therapist refer to the psychiatrist, but make sure that it's more tightly coordinated into the care rather than sitting in its own uh, silo. Um, lots of opportunity in terms of integrating behavioral health with medical specialties, whether oncology, or endocrinology, uh, cardiology, et cetera. Um, Online peer support offers us a different channel for thinking about how we uh, can execute on peer support, both uh, historically in the Medicaid population where peer support really starts and now as it begins to expand into the commercial population. And then Charlie had mentioned that we have a lot going on in terms of uh, pay for performance and really beginning to think about that value-based payment model uh, that uh, Glenda was speaking about. We're eager to embrace that kind of model and to collectively and collaboratively with providers uh, look at what delivers value and what doesn't and really put our focus together on what delivers value to our consumers. And with that, Catherine, I will turn it back to you. <coughs> 
Thank you so much. And thank you. <clears throat> to all of our speakers today for their presentations. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to ask um, a few questions that have come in um, and uh, invite also our speakers to ask questions of each other. I know there's a lot of information presented. Um, and we will, the sl these slides are available on our website along with links to many of the resources um, for our audience that's interested in learning more. Um, one question, you know, Anthem, you all m mentioned the many ways you're working with providers, and we had a lot of questions come in about just how can we improve physician, primary care physicians' education about mental health. Um, and the Kennedy Forum mentioned some of the tools that they have. Um, how can we? How can we improve this education, both, um, you know, things that the health plans can do, as well as, you know, going back to medical school? Is there becoming more of a focus on um, mental health training for primary care physicians? Are there other barriers that we need to come and, and sort of what resources are lacking that, that um, Anthem or the Kennedy Forum could help provide to physicians? Do you, uh, Catherine, is there particularly anybody you want to answer that? Ms. Henry. Anyone can jump in. I'll give my response. I think if we listen to the research and what's worked and what hadn't worked, that um, training in medical school is one thing, and I'm sure there could be improvement in the education of uh, physicians in medical school. But I think we should learn from the numbers of studies that have been done that going in and trying to train uh, primary care doctors about mental health and substance abuse as by itself has not changed outcomes. This has been done many times. So. I would hope people wouldn't waste their money on doing that again. I think what, what we've learned, and John Portnoy explained it very well, this is what these 80 randomized trials or 79 randomized trials have shown, that if you provide and pay for some of the resources to do collaborative care, where you provide a care manager, either embedded or not embedded, a consulting psychiatrist using a measurement-based tool, that does take some additional resources. Um, that uh, then a primary care doc can deliver significantly improved outcomes. So I would hope that people would, you know, learn from what has worked the best. The fact that CMS has now established a payment code that will pay for collaborative care, and they will start paying for it January 1, 2017. My, actually, I would have a question for, the, for Charlie and Sherry at Anthem and the other private insurers on the phone. Why wouldn't you start using that code January 1, uh, 2017 to actually start paying for the services that have the most evidence? Hey, Henry, primary. Charlie. Yeah, hey, hey Henry, Charlie. Charlie. So I, when I saw Henry was going to be on, I knew Catherine I was going to get a question from him. So I'm, I'm glad I, there's some predictive uh, validity to my hunch. So, I, and I, Henry, I'm not sure in terms of that particular code, but at the 50,000 foot level, I wouldn't see why we, we, we wouldn't pay for that code in Medicare, um, where it's currently you know, going to be, go live. And I assume that we would pay for that. And, and just to go back to your first point, I would agree with you. I don't think more information to primary care about you know, mental health or substance abuse or how to diagnose and treat is going to be effective. But that's why we have really come down firmly on the side of a collaborative care model, taking off uh, from the impact model in Washington, collaborating with the AIM Center, and, and building on that. So that's where, we're, that's where we're going. That's great. But also, I would, Charlie, my question would be for you and other payers, not just Anthem, I know you all have been doing a lot, is why wouldn't you, uh, the AMA is creating their code, the CMS uh, created a temporary G code, which will go away as soon as the AMA's code comes into force. And it's a, it's a bundle code, a CPT code, built by the practice covering all these services. So my question is, why wouldn't you turn that on for your commercial business and for Medicaid, given the effectiveness of this model? Henry, this is Sherry. I mean, that's something I'll take as follow-up. In general, I think to Charlie's point, we have been very supportive of looking for how the codes can best support integrated care, whether it's by training the docs on the ESPER codes or uh, now with medication-assisted therapy, making sure the PCPs are uh, billing for the appropriate code that ensures that they're getting the same level of payment that specialists are. So philosophically, I think we're on board with you, um, but I just need to go back and check the details of uh, what the plans are internally. But it's a fair question. That's great, Terry. No, I wasn't really expecting you all to answer that on the phone, but at least they still have a job. Uh. <laughs> hey, but Henry, to the, to, to, on, the, on the same note, I mean, I think 
you know, again, we're philosophically all lined up, and it's a question of then we just, you know, you don't want to just see codes without the program. You want the program. You want to, you want folks who aren't just diagnosing if they don't have a good referral pattern or if they don't know what they're going to do with the patient. So, so we're we're all on board. We want the collaborative care model really to grow and and flourish. Well, I, I think sorry, that's a good point. It's a good part of the whole group on the specifics which are still coming out soon, the specifics of the, how these uh, G codes and then the CPD codes are defined, I think you'll be reassured. What I was really pleased about with CMS's action is they really address the fidelity. They, this bundle code only pays if the primary care doc is using uh, measurement-based care, they're tracking the people in a registry, they have a care manager, and they have a consulting psychiatrist. If you don't touch all those bases, you can't build the code. So it really does you know, without being prescriptive, it sort of says these resource, these types of interventions, you may dilute them in a different way. If they are delivered, you get reimbursed. Excellent. So it would help what it sounds like you all are trying to do with putting a hodgepodge of codes together. This allows you to do it, hopefully, with one code. Absolutely. Look, another, look forward to working with you. Another question we had uh, come in related to the collaborative care model, um, and it speaks to this issue we're just discussing about the Medicare reimbursement is, can you talk a little bit about the workforce sustainability for the model and the fact that a lot of um, mental health specialists are, you know, only will take private pay, won't take insurance. Can you talk about um, sort of how we can help uh, meet the need with our psychiatry workforce and kind of how this, you know, CMS payment might help with that? Well, I'll say one thing that's another thing CMS did last year, which was great. It gave a several million dollar grant to the American Psychiatric Association to train over 3,000 psychiatrists in this collaborative care code co uh, service. So they've been doing that in conjunction with the University of Washington Ames Center where John Fortney works. So on the psychiatrist side, there's been a lot of work over the last year uh, to train psychiatrists in this consultation model because it's a little different from traditional telemedicine or obviously office-based practice. It's not night and day, but it requires some differences. But I think there will be some need for consultation or technical assistance, really, for practices on, you know, what kind of care manager to hire and that kind of thing. But um, at least there's a jump head here on the psychiatry workforce. <clears throat> A bunch of questions also came in sort of related to sharing of patient information. And I don't know, can any of you kind of talk to, um, you know, a lot of folks are kind of struggling with some of the laws that are preventing the sharing of patient information between behavioral health providers and primary care. And how can we balance uh, the 42 CFR Part 2, which protects information about substance use treatment and the need for open communication among the providers that are treating the same patient. This is Sherry. Well, I'll, comment, I'll, I'll comment on that because I think the 42 CFR issue is an issue that we have been advocating on with a variety of stakeholders in terms of it's the, it has put us in a quandary in terms of we're all espousing this integrated care and the opioid crisis just raises the stakes on the lethality of what can be at stake. Um, yet 42 CFR um, basically prohibits and makes very restrict well makes very restrictive the process by which that information can be shared. And we're seeing examples where therefore the kind of data that we can share with providers and the kind of data that we're able to help coordinate is severely limited. And so we uh, are strong advocates for the same HIPAA standard that is applied to medical care also being applied to this level of care um, because it's really a, it's very consistent with the intent of mental health parity. So um, I think it's a true barrier that needs remediation. This is Glenda. I, I also think that there's some extent to which um, SF42 is also misinterpreted and for practices that are delivering care in a way that's integrated, disclosure about the way in which they share information and consent in the process of engaging a patient in that practice setting is an opportunity that the practices that we've worked with have changed the way in which they consent people into their practice to allow for um, sharing of information. I don't know if Henry or John want to add to that. 
Well, I, I do know that there are lots of people who feel there are significant barriers to 42 CFR for good communication. I do, I would, and, and I, maybe Chris Carroll can weigh in because I know that HHS and SAMHSA are looking at some, and may have already proposed some alterations to uh, their privacy standards. But I do want to point out, though, there have been large-scale, ongoing implementations of effective collaborative care models in multiple type settings, staff model, which is easier to do from the privacy point of view, but also large-scale PPO practices, uh, where they have gotten, they have been able to do collaborative care effectively even with those constraints. But it's not to say they don't need to be changes. But Chris, maybe you could let us know what where you see that issue. Um, well, w what I can do is is tell you that where um, we have proposed a rule, it's under the comment period right now, so really can't speak to uh, any specific changes that, that we're going to do. But I can say that um, there are ma major changes in the rule, and uh, we, we think we are going to update and modernize the rule to the point where uh, it's, it's at least better uh, and considerably better. So I, this is not far away from being a, a, a final rule. Um, so, you know, I would look for something in the next week or so. Thanks, Chris. Great. Thank you. And at this time, I'd like to thank our excellent panel of speakers. We are past um, the 4.30 mark for the end of our event and apologize to those uh, questions that we didn't get to. Um, but we do want to thank our speakers who took time from their schedules to be with us and thank them for all the great resources that they have provided. We'd like to ask our audience to take a moment to share feedback from this event by completing a brief survey. And thank you all again for joining us today.